If you're starting to keep bees, how much should you expect to pay for your honeybees? If you're like most beekeepers in the US, you will probably buy your bees either in the form of a package of bees or as a small nucleus colony. And you'll probably pay about 150 to 300 dollars for that. But would you be interested in a healthy, locally acclimated colony of bees at virtually no cost? Swarming is the way that honeybee colonies reproduce. In the spring, as the colony is building up and starting to run out of space in its existing hive, the colony will make more drones, the workers will start to backfill brood cells with honey, they'll also make what's called swarm cells to grow new queens, and as the queen runs out of space to lay, her abdomen will start to shrink, making it easier for her to fly. Then once those new queens are about to emerge, the existing queen and about half of the existing honeybees in the colony will take off to find a new home. Once those bees swarm, that swarm is ripe for the taking for any beekeeper who's willing to collect them off of a tree or fence or anywhere else that they might land. Or they are ready to move into a new bait hive that's prepared for them. Once those bees arrive at their new home, they're ready to start making comb and building a new hive. Before they leave the old hive, they'll gorge themselves on honey, and they'll use that honey when they get to the new hive to make wax and start building comb at a rapid rate. And these caught swarms, especially if they're from a feral colony, are likely to be robust, in good health, and have good disease resistance. Now, it can be controversial to claim that feral honeybees have any greater disease resistance than their commercially raised cousins. But that's exactly what a couple studies published in 2015 and 2017 have shown. Dr. Thomas Seeley has been studying the bees in the Arnott Forest of New York State for decades. And in 2015, a study was published comparing the populations and genetics of the bees that live there now to those that were there before Varroa mites arrived. Population counts were done in the 1970s. There weren't any population counts done in the 1990s, but it's generally accepted that those wild populations were decimated during that time. However, a study published in 2015 after taking a census of the bees in that forest have found that those populations have completely recovered to their pre-Varroa levels. In addition, the study from 2017 showed that those feral populations have the same winter and summer survival rates as they did in the 1970s, even though the populations now are generally infected with Varroa. These studies have shown us that the current feral population has an increased ability to live with the Varroa mite. And there's no reason to believe that that isn't true across feral populations throughout the United States. Now, if you catch a swarm, there's no guarantee that that swarm is from a feral colony or from some other beekeeper's hive. But either way, the fact that those bees swarmed, particularly an early spring primary swarm, tells us a couple things about that population. It would be from a hive that has successfully overwintered. And that tells us that those bees have lived in there for probably about, at least about a year, and are fairly acclimated to our environment. It also tells us that it's a healthy hive strong enough to cast a swarm. And both of those are evidence of healthy, robust bees that are acclimated to your environment. And it's that local adaptation that may be the most valuable characteristic of caught swarms. Within the genus of Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, there are certain varieties. For example, you have Italian, Carniolan, and Russian honeybees. Those different varieties tend to be well adapted for the environment from which they originated. Italian bees, for example, which are very popular, are from Southern Europe. And because of that, they adapt well to the Southern US where the climate is similar. But if you take a package of Italian honeybees and put them in a northern climate of Minnesota, then those bees are unlikely to be in sync with the bloom and nectar flow of that northern climate. And also, they are genetically not well adapted to live in that northern climate. Feral bees, which have lived in that area for generations possibly, are going to have adapted and be well accustomed to that climate and they will build up their brood and draw back their brood in sync with 
your nectar flow. Of course, there's also the undeniable financial benefit that a swarm doesn't cost you anything over the equipment used to catch and house them. And it's hard to argue with free bees. If you want to catch a honeybee swarm, you'll need to provide a suitable habitat in a suitable location at the right time. Dr. Thomas Seeley has done extensive research on honeybee behavior and has published an informational bulletin titled Bait Hives for Honeybees. I'll post a link to that bulletin in the description. The timing of catching swarms isn't complicated and is pretty broad. Basically, swarming happens in the spring as the colonies are building up all the way into summer and there might even be swarms in the fall. I try to have my bait hives up by April expecting a peak of swarming in May and June and tapering off into July. There might be swarms in August and September, but those late season swarms will require feeding if they have any chance of surviving through winter. In his publication, Dr. Seeley provides some guidelines on parameters for catching swarms. First, he recommends that the swarm trap height should be about 15 feet or five meters above ground level. The swarm trap should be in a location that's well shaded but highly visible. He says that bees will often avoid or abandon a swarm trap that's in direct sun. Dr. Seeley says the distance from the parent nest is not really important. Bees will travel for a mile or more looking for a new home. But I would recommend not putting the bait hive right next to the original colony because the bees will also recognize the potential of competition with an existing hive. The total entrance area for the bait hive should be about one and a half to two square inches or 10 to 15 square centimeters. The shape of the entrance is not important, but the entrance should be positioned near the floor of the hive. It's preferable to hang your bait hive with the entrance facing south or southeast, but other directions will also work. The volume of your bait hive should be about 1.4 cubic feet or about 40 liters, which as it happens is about the volume of one 10 frame Langstroth deep body. The shape of the cavity is not important to the bees, but the interior of the cavity should be dry and snug especially at the top. The type of wood is really not important, but bees might avoid the smell of new lumber. And speaking of odor, anything that makes the bait hive smell like it once held bees is beneficial, such as beeswax or propolis. And a scent attractant like lemongrass oil is also a big help. I think it's a good practice to read the publication and understand the study behind these parameters. But in my limited experience, I think that there's two parameters that stand out as the most important, and that is the volume of the cavity and the odor. I agree with Dr. Seeley's conclusion that a bait hive with about the same volume as a 10 frame deep box is best. When scout bees go looking for a new home for the swarm, they will measure the interior and exterior of any possible location. A small colony will move into a small space but a large swarm requires a bigger space. But a larger box also requires more effort to hang in a tree. And especially when it's full of bees, takes more effort to get down. So a 10 frame Langstroth box or a box of similar size seems to provide about the right balance for adequate space and manageability. I think scent is probably the most critical factor of attracting a swarm to your bait hive. The traps I've used are six frame layens boxes built of fairly thin plywood to be lightweight. And plans for these are available on horizontalhive.com and I'll put a link in the description. To reduce the new lumber smell of the plywood, I scorch the interior of the boxes with a torch. And then I rub down the inside with old comb and rub the corners with propolis to make it smell like it's been home to bees. Dr. Seeley's publication recommends against the use of old comb, and that's to avoid attracting wax moths and other possible vermin. But I think a frame of old brood comb is a critical part of attracting bees to your box. It provides comb that they can already start building on and it absolutely smells like it's been a home for bees in the past. So I use one frame of old brood comb and it doesn't even have to look nice. As long as it's old brood comb and has that smell to it, then it'll be beneficial. On the rest of the frames, I'll just use a starter strip of wax foundation and give plenty of space for the bees to build on once they move in. Besides the comb, 
I also use lemongrass oil as a scent lure. This scent mimics the bee's own Nazanoff attractant pheromone. Swarm trappers debate the benefit of lemongrass oil versus a commercial attractant like Swarm Commander, but I'll stay out of that debate for now. One thing important to consider is that bees' sense of smell is magnitude stronger than ours. If the smell of the lure is readily evident to you, it's probably too strong to the bees and can deter them. For my swarm traps, I use a plastic slow release vial, half filled with lemongrass oil, and that seems adequate. As for hanging the swarm trap, there are different methods that people use. You could just strap the bait hive to a tree using ratchet straps and leave it at that. Or some people will put a vertical board on the back of the swarm trap with a hole at the top to hang the trap on a screw. Another possibility is to hang a platform to put the swarm trap on or just use an existing platform like a deer stand. I went a slightly different direction and I built a separate hanger using a French cleat system to put my swarm traps on. The hangers themselves, just like the one you see right here, is very lightweight, easy to carry up and down a ladder, and when I put it up in the tree I can put a screw in at first to just hang it on the hole right here and then from there I can level it and uh, screw it to the tree to stabilize it do whatever I need to do until that hanger itself is level in all directions once the hanger is level all I have to do is bring my swarm trap with a cleat on the back side of it and hang that right onto the hanger now I purposefully made the cleats longer than the box is wide. And that way when I'm up on a ladder facing this box after I have put it up on the hanger, then I can just reach around to each side and put a screw in down through the French cleat to hold it in place. If I have my swarm trap out in a remote location, I don't want to take the chance of a storm coming through and possibly blowing it off. But I found that these are really pretty stable and not prone to falling off of the hanger. And then when I do catch a swarm, all I have to do is take that swarm trap off the hanger, carry it down, and put another swarm trap right back up in its place. Because the hanger is already leveled, I don't have to re-level anything. I can just reuse that hanger for a new swarm trap and potentially catch a swarm in the same location. As for locating your swarm traps, there are some general considerations. Bees tend to use linear features like power lines or tree lines or fence rows for navigation, and so putting a swarm trap along those lines can be helpful. Proximity to water is also beneficial because bees do need to collect water. And bees often won't move into a bait hive that's too close to other hives. Now having said all that, I encourage you not to overthink or stress over hanging your swarm traps. I don't have the research background of Dr. Seeley, but I'll share with you what limited experience I do have. In my first year of attempting to trap bees, I hung up seven traps in various locations throughout our area, trying to find the ideal locations along tree lines, looking at where power lines were running, trying to hang them at the correct height, trying to get everything as close to perfect as I could. Every two weeks I'd go around and I would check those swarm traps for any sign of bees having moved in and occasionally I'd have to kick out wasps and roaches and ants and all sorts of other stuff. But I never caught a single colony of bees that year. The following year because of having done a trap out and splitting that colony and having been given a nucleus colony, I had five colonies starting the year. And so I didn't need to go out and put up as many swarm traps as I had the year before. I put a swarm trap up in the tree that sits in the front yard of our suburban home about 20 feet from our front door. And I put my trap hanger up where I could reach it standing on the ground so I could just put the trap up and not have to worry about going up and down a ladder. My reason for putting a trap there was that if any of my colony swarmed, I wanted to have a chance of catching them rather than having them move into any of my neighbors' eaves or attics. And in that trap, in its less than ideal location, I caught two swarms. I don't believe either of those swarms was from any of my hives. If getting honeybees for free interests you, 
I encourage you to get ready to start trapping some swarms next spring. Plan out your equipment, your trap locations, and how you're going to hang your bait hives. Get your frames of old comb and your scent lures ready to get in those trap boxes when the time comes. And then when swarm season comes, get out there and catch some free bees. Good luck in your swarm catching. If you've enjoyed this video and find it beneficial, you might also like this other one that Google thinks you'll really like. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.